number 10, veil. Through this video, you will come to find out that a lot of the wedding traditions that we practice these days have some pretty messed up origins. We'll get through a lot of them throughout this list, but let's start off by talking about the bride's veil. These days, a lot of brides choose to wear a veil on their wedding day. With so many different styles to choose from, this accessory is known to add that extra little pizzazz, little spice to the look. But throughout history, veils were used for different things, some of them being a tad bit messed up. Just a smidge. The rather obvious reason for brides to wear a veil back in the day had to do with religion and staying modest. But this hasn't been the only reason for veils. In ancient Rome, brides wore veils because it was believed to be effective at warding off evil spirits. The most messed up reason for the veil though, at least in my opinion anyway, has to do with the wedding transaction, so to speak. Since back in the olden days, marrying your daughter off was seen as more of a transaction, brides would wear veils to cover their faces and they wouldn't be lifted until after they were proclaimed husband and wife so that the groom wouldn't be able to back out if he didn't like how his bride looked. Seems pretty messed up to me, but what are your thoughts on it? Tell us down in the comments. Number 9. When Doves Cry I've been to one wedding where they released doves, like actual real life doves, and I was like, do they actually do this? I couldn't believe my eyes. I didn't know it was a real thing. Why do we do this? Well, because doves mate for life, and they build a nest, and then they Netflix and chill until the end of their dove days. Sounds like perfect symbolism if I've ever heard it. Back in ancient Roman and Greek times, doves were often used as gifts from the bride to the groom. Pretty shitty gift if you ask me. Here's a bird that we now have to both take care of. The snow white ring neck dove is used by magicians. They can't fly too well. They don't have a homing instinct. Whereas rock doves, the ones commonly used in weddings that we see fly away over Nana's head, they have a homing instinct for hundreds of miles. So they're perfect for the gig. But they couldn't be released during foul weather and they needed two hours before the sun sets in order for them to fly home. The wedding band has less rules than the doves. That's amazing, they're riders much smaller. If you were to catch one of these doves at a wedding, you were also allowed to keep it back in the day. Also, great hands. I don't know who's catching birds or why they want to keep it and put it in their pocket, but you do you. At number eight, best man. These days, the role of the best man normally goes to the guy who's closest to the groom, whether that's a brother or a best friend. But back during the time where women were married off like property, the role of the best man was very different and was all about protecting one's assets. Back then, bride napping was actually very common, so if there was someone else who wanted to marry someone who was already promised to another person, they might try and steal her away for themselves. Yeah, why? I don't know. This is where the best man came in. The best man's job was to protect the bride and if she was stolen, the best man would be the one to enter whatever battle or duel was necessary to get the bride back. The best man was literally there to be the best fighter. The best man was also there to watch over the bride to make sure that she didn't try and make a run for it herself. They really said, try to derail this wedding and see what happens. Number seven, men's fashion. By far, one of the best ways to show that you are not one of the lowly plebeians back in medieval times would be your clothes. We've talked about how stripes were the pattern of the devil, but they had some weirder trends back in the Middle Ages. For example, long and pointy shoes were a very big sign of wealth, and the longer and pointier the shoe, the more gold pieces were lining your pocket. Men loved to show off their bodies back then too. But they didn't have BMWs back in the day, so one way a dude could compensate for himself was the aptly named codpiece, which was a pouch attached to the front of a man's pantaloons, perfectly shaped and padded to display their masculinity. It's like that one dad at the beach wearing the speedo, except maybe a little less nightmare inducing. Number 6. Hairless Nobody wants to go bald, just ask Jada Smith. Medieval times had different thoughts about this however. Not only was a receding hairline normal, but that was the thing for ladies at the time. You might be thinking it's all about the waist, the legs, or the booty. Well, not back then. So if the forehead is all the rage, focus on it, right? Makes sense. How is this done? Well, you can start by plucking those lashes, don't need those, then pluck the eyebrows, ain't gonna need those either, and just start reeling back that hairline. Oh, perfect, now you're ready for a night on the town. The history of women's fashion and traditions is a story of pain, beauty, and some really weird choices. Number five, animal court. Oh, did you think the courtroom was a place only for members of the human species? <laughs> Au contraire. In fact, all kinds of members of the animal kingdom, from insects to dolphins, would stand trial if they were believed to be guilty of crimes. Some animals were executed, 
Some received strongly worded letters, and some were even proven not guilty. A rooster was once given the verdict of guilty for laying eggs. Truly the most unnatural of crimes. Pigs were usually the ones who got the most amount of court time, with one account even having a pig dressed in a waistcoat, gloves, pants, and a human mask to meet his end. I wonder if these animals were judged by a jury of their peers. Hmm. Number 4. Bloodletting Look, we all know that a lot of men in their mid-40s treat their bodies like a rusted out Chevy Tahoe. I'm one and the same. Yeah, it needs a lot of work, but dad got an oil change, so that makes it all that makes it all better. This was common back in medieval times. A simple fix or a one fix fits all for every health issue was, of course, bloodletting. The old drain you of your precious life juice so you can get a detox, bro. Look, at first glance, yeah, it makes sense. If my Chevy runs a wee bit better after an oil change, then why not? It makes sense. Well, the truth is, there really isn't any new blood going in, so it's not so much as an oil change as it is so much just draining you of your energy, bro. Did it really work? Ah, not really. Arguably, it made things worse. This was also a treatment to make your skin pale, and uh, as my previous point with the ladies, that was also seen as beautiful, so remember that. Go to blood clinic. Please don't drain your blood to look prettier. Number three, wedding cake. As the youngest of three, I can confirm that we get away with the most. The youngest often do. The middle child is just plain ignored, and then the oldest, well, they usually have the most responsibility in the family. Usually when a bride and groom cut the cake on their big day, it's for them. They save a piece till their anniversary, they put it in their partner's face, it's fun, whatever they want to do. Often in history, the eldest child would get the first slice. How lucky is that? When it came down to cutting the actual cake too, well, that meant that the bride is no longer a virgin. It's an awkward few bites. Wedding cakes today are delicious and they're pretty much an art form. TV shows are devoted to them, like Cake Boss and other cake shows that I can't think of. If you're lucky, you might find a few cake charms on the inside as well back in the day. Real, non-edible cake charms. You wanted to find these in your cake. They brought good omens to the table. To find a rocking chair meant that you were going to live a long life. An anchor means you're bound for adventure, sailors ahoy. And a purse meant that you would have good fortune. Let's just hope you didn't find the charms with your teeth or else you would be using said new fortune fixing your chiclets. Very metal, very real. <laughs> Not good. At number two, plague flowers. In a lot of weddings, the flowers are very important. There's the flowers for the centerpieces, the bouquets for the bride and bridesmaids. There's flowers everywhere. Get your Benadryl. But why is that? Well, the idea of carrying a bouquet at a wedding dates back to ancient Greece, where it was believed that carrying a bouquet was thought to ward off evil spirits. But a little later on down the line, the presence of bouquets at weddings got a little bit darker and a little more precautionary. During the Middle Ages into the Renaissance, when the Black Death was running rampant throughout Europe, people were trying anything and everything to try and ward off the plague. Back then, people believed that smells carried contagion, so people would would fill their pockets with fragrant things to keep the plague at bay. This was later integrated into wedding practices and brides started carrying around a bouquet of stinky stuff like garlic and dill to protect them from catching anything. Over the years, the stinky stuff was replaced with nice smelling flowers, but really, no one cares what's in the bouquet anymore because all people want to do is participate in the wedding hunger games and fight to the death to catch the bouquet at the end of the night. Why? Why are we hurting each other for this? Why? And finally, number one, wedding rings. One ring to rule them all. Perhaps the most important piece of the wedding puzzle, rings. Whenever somebody is about to pop the question, everybody around them always needs to see the ring. Congrats, let me see the ring. Oh my God, is it this, is it this? Egyptian pharaohs first used rings to represent this eternal life. The circle has no beginning or ending. They created this concept that we adore to this day. The center of the ring was also believed to be the gateway to the unknown. Your finger just disappears, you're like, what the f these Egyptian Ouroboros rings were the first, a snake eating its own tail, hashtag love. When Greeks came in the picture, they took this tradition, started using copper and iron rings in ceremonies, and the iron rings had a key symbol on them, meaning that the wife now has control of the house. If you like it, then you should have put a key on it. Come medieval times, the ring gets another upgrade. Now we have these precious gems to be added to them. A little bit more glam. Rubies symbolized passion, sapphires symbolized the heavens, and diamonds to show strength because they were rock hard and obviously you know the rest. Come the 12th century, the Christian church declared marriage as a holy sacrament, so rings were solely used now for that ceremony. That's when the engagement ring came into place. There needed to be another trade or promise that was just as strong as a wedding band. So now there's rings for pretty much everything. Number 10, 
Public latrines. Starting this list off, we're going back to the Romans. Do as they do, right? So picture a modern day locker room, just all sitting beside each other, but toilets. Yeah, gross, but social. And everyone helped each other. Uh, yeah, whenever you're done with that little sponge thing there, Patroclus, throw her on down, buddy boy, thanks. Take your time. Yeah, in ancient Rome, public latrines, AKA public washrooms, didn't have toilet paper, or seats, or hand soap, or separators. Just sitting on a church pew, shoulder to shoulder. Yeah, worst part, you would just sit and share a stick with a sponge thing stuck on top of it. You would all share the sponge. It's tradition, right? They did this for like a thousand years. Said it built confidence and social skills. Dude, I can't even go to a urinal with someone sitting beside me because I'm shy, let alone sitting next to each other, showing each other's pictures from the cottage weekend, talking shop in front of 10 people. Hey buddy, you mind just scooching over there? Yeah, it's gonna be a messy one. We ate a lot of figs earlier. Thanks. Number nine. Feed the dead. Since we're on the topic of ancient Rome, let's dive in with a couple of libations. Yeah, we love libations around here. Throughout history, libations have been offered to the dead. Honor those who have passed, right? One of these, pour one out for the homie, right? Where did this come from? Well, this is a tradition that we still see today, but it began, of course, in the ancient world. It began in Egypt and other parts of Africa, and of course, ancient Greece. Those are the main, main three right there. Pour one out for the lad, but in ancient Roman tradition, they would actually pour the wine into their resting place. How amazing is that? Just a nice snorkel for the dead. Romans crafted these lead or wood tubes during their lost comrade's burial. They would have it included. So afterwards, it's a one-way trip to the afterlife. You're not spilling anything on the ground. Nobody gets left behind in celebrations, even after death. I love it. I could see how one would think this is a little unnatural, but I'd be lying to you if I said I wasn't getting any ideas right about now. Yeah, after I go, just dump a bunch of iron brew down the pipe. I'll be good. I'll be strong as in the next life. Number eight, boot and rally. Ah, the old boot and rally. Drinking beers from a stinky old used boot. The old shoey. Yeah, I've played some rugby over the years. I've drank a boot or two for a nasty try. And let me tell you, when your six, eight flanker has athlete's foot, probably the most disgusting tradition that we could probably shouldn't let live on. The boot and rally started from military origins. Soldiers would celebrate or initiate each other by drinking a full beer from a fellow comrade's, or even if you were lucky enough, the general's boot. Yeah, after, of course, it had been worn all day. Fighting battles. Can you imagine what you'd step on in and over during a battle or war? That's pretty gross, dude. Just so hot and stinky and wet from the muck and mud, and it's your turn to enjoy a crispy Molson out of a size 13 wide with trench foot? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. No, I'm, I'm full. Not to be confused, of course, with puke and rally. That's, well, I guess, well, also hand in hand with each other, you know? They go together, like spaghetti and meatballs. The old puking from drinking out of a shoe and then drinking some more until you mm, puke more. Tradition. Skull! Number seven, a June wedding. As we're counting down this list slowly but surely, you've probably begun fantasizing maybe about your own wedding one day. Maybe it's a beach wedding, maybe it's themed like a winter wonderland. Doesn't that sound cozy? It's your big day, get creative. They say the best month to get married is June, and from a Canadian point of view, I can absolutely agree with that. In ancient Roman times, however, getting married in June was a must, not just a thing you wanted to do. See, June was the month of the god Juno. They protect women in life when it comes to marriage and childbirth, so if it's between that and like, I don't know, Halloween, obviously we're gonna go with June. Better omens for sure. Another myth is that bathing was rarely done back then, so when majority of the population did finally you know, wash up. At the end of May or beginning of June, that's often when it would happen. Everybody smelled nice, they felt good, and they wanted to celebrate. So it was perfect timing. Better get me while my pits smell good, you know? That's a myth, but I can also see it checking out. A June wedding in ancient Roman days was also done so that after a spring birth, the mother can quickly hop back into action and help with that summer's harvest. Maternity leave who? Never heard of her. At number six, hashtag twinning. You know how at weddings the bridesmaids are usually wearing matching outfits? Well, this tradition dates back centuries, though it has changed slightly over the years. Remember how I mentioned that people would sometimes try to kidnap the bride on her wedding day? Well other than the best man and the groomsmen trying to play their part in protecting the bride from being taken, the bridesmaids also played a part in that too. The bridesmaids used to dress identically to the bride so that it would make it harder to spot her and therefore prevent anyone from kidnapping her. This practice dates all the way back to ancient Rome and feudal China and didn't really start to fade out of tradition until around the 1880s. These days you get a couple of gifts from the bride for being in her posse, but back then you didn't get any 
anything, and you had to risk your safety for your girl Becky, who doesn't even want to marry Jeff down the block. I don't know. Number five, a toast. My favorite part of a wedding has to be the speeches or the toasts. They're always way too long or too personal or you know what, just too depressing. Just way too sad, just tears. You're like, why, why are we talking about this? It's a nerve wracking part, even as a guest, just to get up randomly and be like, okay, look at me everyone, hi. No, I don't want to do that. Back in the 1800s though, only men were allowed to give these toasts. The oldest friend, the groom, the best man, and then the father of the bride. The whole thing would have been done in eight minutes. Guys suck at speeches. They're just like, uh, uh, a lot of ums, that's all I'm saying. Wedding toasts go back as far as the 6th century BC. When Greeks were getting married, the father of the bride would drink the first glass of wine just to make sure it wasn't poisoned or anything. Romans would also drop a piece of burnt toast into the wine in order to make the wine taste less bitter, hence the term toast. Yeah, now we get it. Yeah, wine was so bad back then, they had to use burnt toast crystal light just to get through the day. Yuck. At number four, transaction. I find it to be just a little bit messed up how before now, marriage was mostly about money or status and not about love. For a long time, people didn't get to choose who they got to marry and there was almost always some kind of monetary transaction involved in the wedding. This whole idea here is a reason for the traditional act of the bride's father walking her down the aisle and giving her away, so to speak. In the past, fathers of the bride and groom would come together to establish an agreement, like X amount of money for someone's daughter or whatever. Once that was set up, the wedding became a big deal to see if the transaction would actually go through and many precautions were put in place to make sure that no one backed out. One of those precautions was the act of the father walking his daughter down the aisle. This was done so that they stayed close to one another in the off chance that the groom or his family decided to back out. That really took the romance and sparkle out of weddings now. Number two, hazing. First off, I don't condone it. Second off, I've never done it or been a part of it. Not really a frat guy myself. But I did have friends dare me to do stupid growing up. I can't lie. North America is full of colleges and universities who take part in this tradition as they take it very seriously. If you can even call it a tradition. The hazing rituals that commence in fraternities and sororities can be deadly, literally. There's a million scary stories that are true surrounding these challenging initiation processes. And I'd say the majority of them are sadistic and dangerous. If you have to do something that risks your life to prove that you're down, nah man, that's not for me. I got essays to write. Hazing has a history dating as far back to 387 BC with the founding of Plato's Academy. At the time, hazing was called penalism, which meant, quote, a system of mild oppression and torment practiced upon first year students. Torment is the right word here. Even Plato criticized the practice of hazing. He's like, no, nah, that is too much. -eth. Like I understand camaraderie and brotherhood and all, but like chugging ketchup until you're on life support, like the school debt's enough, you know? And finally, number one, the monkey buffet. Okay, this last one here is a little unusual, but I want involved, have a little FOMO already, just looking at this. Look at these little guys, come on, they're having so much fun. As its name subtly suggests, the monkey buffet festival in Bangkok has everybody at the table. Everybody eats. Smack dab right in the middle of the ruins of the Frag Pram Sam Yacht Temple in Laburi, Thailand, a beautiful tall banquet awaits. It's a 13th century temple just covered in fresh fruit. It looks so inviting, I'm like, I'm hungry right now and I'm looking at it, I'm like, oh boy. Thing is, I said everybody eats, that's, that's not entirely true. This feast is held in celebration of Laburi's thousands of macaques, thought to bring good luck to the area and its people. Only the macaques eat at this festival, and yes, it can get a little messy, obviously. They like throwing food around, I've heard. They like throwing their it as well, so maybe just kinda heads up, I don't know. So if you're attending, bring your own snack, or else there's pre-chewed watermelon waiting for you. That's also yummy too, if you don't mind. The macaque hair, just avoid that. We'll Pull it out. Number 10, carrying a sword. Whenever we see medieval shows or hear stories or see art, everybody always has a sword at their side. I'll admit on one hand, literally, it's pretty badass. Was this really that common though in the 12th century? Was everyone gifted a sword on their 16th birthday like in Zelda Wind Waker? No, no, of course not. I mean, if you were traveling, sure, ideally you'd want a little dagger or a little something to help you out, but swords were a symbol of wealth and status. And the bigger and shinier the tune, the better, right? 
On average, these things would cost you seven months worth of wages. So you best start saving up and training. Yeah, you might want to train as well because these things were not light. No, not at all. Ideally, medieval swords would weigh three to four pounds. Doesn't sound like much at first, but I know after eight minutes, I would be switching arms real quick. It's like when you hold your hand up in class, you're like, oh God, what's going on here? Gotta do some push-ups. In our number nine spot today, we have the death cage. If you were to take a look at the punishments used in history, it quickly becomes clear that people of the past just really liked watching people die or have pain inflicted upon them. It's very strange, it's very dark, and it certainly is not for the faint of heart. The death cage is just one of the many horrifying punishments used during the Dark Ages. Essentially, this was just one method of execution that was extremely public, as they would strip the person down and lock them in an iron cage that was placed placed somewhere that everyone would be able to see. From here, the condemned person would be locked in there with no food or water, and everyone would just watch as they slowly died. Unbelievably messed up for a multitude of reasons, for sure. Sometimes, to make matters even worse, however, the condemned person would also be slathered in milk and honey, so that they would also be attracting insects, just to make the whole dying process even worse. It's all bad. I'm just thankful that those days are over. Number eight, the summer of 13 1848, AKA the Black Death. Now let's talk about this horrible event, shall we? If you thought summer 2020 sucked, well, buckle up, this one was pretty bad too. The bubonic plague traveled, the bubonic plague arrived to medieval England in 1348 and the death toll here was absolutely devastating. Somewhere from one third to half of England's population gone, just like that, and that's it. The plague hit hard and it hit fast. Now today we have variations of the virus, the one we shall not name, but back then the plague was a bacterium now known as Yersinia pestis. Now symptoms were quite jarring. You got lumps in the groin or your armpits, so that can't be comfortable. And next, the infected would notice black spots appearing all over their body. Almost all that were infected died within three days. More often than not, without a fever, so you wouldn't see it coming, aside from the black spots and the things I just said. Now, the drop in the population resulted in a widespread of wealth, workers were demanding higher wages, and farmers were demanding lower rents. The poor got expandable income, so it kinda, kinda helped, kinda didn't, I don't know, I don't know how to explain that. The Black Death spread more than a mile per day, and it's all thanks to traders and travelers. Yeah, humans can't stay still for a bit. We love traveling, even through the Black Death. Cause you know, why not, roads are empty. As long as there aren't any rats hiding on board, maybe you'll make it. Number seven. Crummy wine. Nice, I love drinking wine and then immediately having to chew. That's lovely, let's talk about that. My favorite part of a wedding has to be the speeches, or the toasts, right, whatever. I love watching somebody improv their way through an important wedding speech. The train wreck, always. They're always way too long, way too personal, or just sad. Throw a joke in, I don't know, maybe a pun, wouldn't hurt. But where did this all begin, right? Back in the 1800s, only men were allowed to give these toasts, which is hilarious. It was always the oldest friend, the groom, best man, father of the bride, you name it. The whole thing would have been done in eight minutes, I imagine, because guys suck at speeches. At least from what I've seen, a lot of ums, a lot of ums. Wedding toasts go back as far as the 6th century BC. When Greeks were getting married, the father of the bride would drink the first glass of wine to make sure there was no poison in it. What an OG. Romans would drop a piece of burnt toast into the wine in order to make the wine taste less bitter as well. Yeah, hence the term toast. Yeah, wine was so bad back in the day, they had to use burnt toast, crystal light, just to make it better. Okay, cheers, that's it. Number six, handshakes. We all do it. Meeting the in-laws folks about to smash a job interview usually starts with this. Hey, how are ya? Nice to meet you. But after living through this pandemic, why do we still do this? Well, the handshake has existed in some form or another for thousands of years. One popular theory is that the gesture began as a way of conveying your intentions of peace. Lots of loyalty issues back then. Empty hand means no weapons. Some suggest that the up and down motion of the handshake was supposed to dislodge any knives or loose hidden up the sleeve threats. The other explanation is that the handshake was a symbol of trust and that I give you my germs, you give me your germs. We both trust each other, hands meet in hands. Now, add a little bit of spit or some blood into the mix and we got ourselves a real bond there, brother. The bacteria from one person to another person would be shared and mutual. Disgusting. In ancient Rome, the handshake was even used as a symbol of friendship and love. Oh, well, that's nice. A pair of clasped hands even appear on the ancient Roman coins, signifying peace. That's a good one, I like this. This, it turned from gross to nice all of a sudden. Number five, wet willies. And immediately, back into the gross, here we go. I'm already angry thinking about a wet willy. I've gotten a few in my life and I'm still mad at all three of them. 
Whoever thought of this, like, yeah, I'm just gonna suck my finger and then put it in someone's head, put it right in their ear canal. Freaks, disgusting. Keep your coffee breath away from my good ideas. This weird tradition slash prank slash gross hobby all began back in 1864 in, of course, England. You guessed it, that's the origin of the term. And it all started when a wet, salivated finger went in the ear of an English fisherman named, you guessed it again, Willie. What if I said Brian? You'd be like, what the? What William? We could do that. A wet, what Walter? Ooh, that's a bit too serious. Everybody laughed at this point, okay? This changed the game. It was like the moonwalk. Everyone was like, what did he just do? What happened? How did he do that? Growing up with ear problems, don't do wet willies. Wet willies are a bad idea. Digging out wax with your pinky even can create problems. If a vacuum forms between your ear and the eardrum, and then all of a sudden you, the sudden depressurization can damage your eardrums. And also, uh, it's fucking disgusting. So don't do those anymore. Number four, blowing out candles. I just did this a couple weeks ago. So the people who ate that cake, yeah, sorry for all my germs. But it's my party and I'll cry if I want to. That should be a song. The age old tradition of aggressively exhaling your bodily fluid and air before arguing over who gets the biggest piece. I love it. Traditions, right? However, thanks to modern medicine now, we know blowing out candles can expel virus particles, just like breathing, shouting, coughing, and sneezing. And if the person's infected, that makes it a really gross. So a nice big gust of your lungs ought to do it. People believe that the smoke from the candles carry their wishes and prayers off to the gods. Good omens kind of deal. It's also thought that the smoke would ward off evil spirits and bring positive energy for the coming year. Either or, it's fucking gross and we all still do it. Next time you're about to make a wish on your special day, just remember you're spitting on a cake. Am I wrong here? Birthday to you. <laughs> Number two, bucket family style. For my last one today, we're getting real cozy. Real cozy. Remember in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory when all his grandparents have to share that one rickety old bed? Well, that's what everybody at home looked like in the dark ages. Imagine being in the middle. I'm already anxious thinking about it, just stuck. I mean, think about it though. Back then, space was so limited. Warmth is also a plus in those winter nights. And beds, they were massive. They were made of straw and wood. It was a whole thing. It was a whole situation. It's not like you could fit more than one of these in your home. No way, Jose. Even even in the royal household, this was a common theme. King Richard I of England and King Philip II of France both had to sleep in the same bed as an act of diplomacy. Again, I would be so anxious and awkward there. I'd be like, oh, excuse me, Mr. King guy. You're snoring too loud. In our number one spot today, we have affairs of the court. If you know anything about marriage in the Dark Ages, you know that love was often not a part of it. To sort of piggyback off my last point, if you were in a loveless marriage like most everyone else was in the time, but didn't want to go through the process of beating your spouse to a pulp or any of the other divorce methods at the time, you could instead turn to courtly love. This wasn't for the common household and instead was for members of the court, but it allowed the lords and ladies of the time to experience love and courtship despite what their marital status might be. Yeah. It was a place for married people to go and hook up. Well, not entirely. I mean, there of course were rules in place and society was very pious, so people weren't exactly hooking up, but it was a huge hit. People danced, they giggled, they flirted, and sometimes people could even be caught holding hands. One of the rules of courtly love just stated, marriage is no real excuse for not loving. In our number seven spot today, we have the meowing nuns. Mass hysteria wasn't necessarily uncommon in the dark ages. There are a few instances we could discuss, but for today, I want to talk about one of my favorites. In the book, The Epidemics of the Middle Ages, which was written by J.F. Hecker in 1844, there was the description of a very strange case of mass hysteria that broke out among nuns in a French convent in the Middle Ages. Basically, one day a nun in this French convent started to meow like a cat. I'm not sure why, I'm not sure how this started, all I know is that it happened. And you know what else happened? Other nuns in the convent began to all also meow like cats. Eventually it became such a thing that all of the nuns in the convent would meow together for a certain period of time. And of course, everyone surrounding this area was like, what in the absolute heck is going on right now? This is actually a huge problem because in these times, cats were hated. People associated cats with the devil and with disease. So a bunch of meowing nuns was like the equivalent of doomsday. Apparently, the way that this stopped was that the police came and threatened to whip the nuns if the meowing 
flying didn't stop, which is definitely one of the weirdest things I've ever said. Number six, peddlers. Ah yes, that medieval businessman just wandering along in the pine forest in hopes of not getting robbed, a classic image from medieval times. The Dark Ages were a dangerous game, right? So one could only imagine how hard it must have been for a merchant who travels the countryside for a living to sell goods. In Breath of the Wild, you're like, oh, thank God, there's that one guy with all the goods that I need. How convenient is this? Awesome. That's not in real life. In the Middle Ages, traveling village to village wasn't an easy task. You couldn't order an Uber and then voila, and unless you were a knight, you probably didn't have a noble steed to take you there. But even so, an outsider showing up to your village to sell goods from a distant land? I don't know, sounds a little sus if you ask me personally. Peddlers were more often than not welcomed with suspicion by locals. Most of the time, peddlers were just accused of being criminals, even if they weren't. Guy shows up, he's like, hey, wanna buy some watches? They're like, you're a robber, you're going away. In our number five spot today, we have donations. In the Dark Ages, it wouldn't necessarily be strange to either donate or sell your own urine. Yeah, the market was hot for urine because they used it a bunch during this time in history. Medieval chamber pots would collect all of the stuff from an entire household or public space wherever they were placed. And oftentimes they could later be sold at the local tanner or fuller in town. I mean, talk about an easy way to make some money, but how horrible. The reason this product was so popular is because it was used in a variety of ways. It could be used to clean clothing, to help with the dyeing process, to tan leather hides, and like I spoke about in a recent video, be used to help in the cotton making process in order to make the material soft and not frayed. While the practical uses make the wholesale process a little less peculiar, it honestly still would just be weird to have to sell your own pee or your neighbor's pee. Number four, color coordinated. I get it, on Wednesdays we wear pink. It's nice to add a little color into your schedule at work in the office. It's fun, sure, have at it. In medieval times, they were serious about their looks and colors. There was no fun around back then. Having rules about what colors and what type of clothing and hats you could wear, you named it. It was all based on your occupation or social level. Some colors were banned for certain professions. Imagine that. For example, imagine if you were a night worker, right? If I can say that, a woman lady of the night. You weren't allowed to wear certain styles or colors. That's hilarious. Hey, welcome to Ontario. We don't wear jeans here. Got it? All right, now get in. 15th century English law banned knights or anybody below knights from wearing velvet, which is so random to me and so funny looking back. Now imagine that. And you may know this one, but purple was a fancy color back then. Purple has been associated with royalty even since the ancient world. Natural purple dye was rare, and medieval Europeans believed that mixing dyes was unnatural and diabolic. It was a no-no. So they were missing out on purple for quite a while, because they didn't want to, you know, mix goods, if I can say that. Number three, Feast of Fools. Before the church took the fun of going overboard out of pretty much everything. Every January 1st in France, the whole social hierarchy got topsy-turvy with the Feast of Fools. No, this was not a festival promoting fool-related cannibalism. Instead, the highest respected religious officials swapped with the lowest, and serving maids became masters with a king of misrule being crowned. The event was meant to display the biblical phrase, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise which is a creative excuse for parades, comic performances, costumes, cross-dressing, song, and naturally, way too much drinking. But like I said, thanks to the rowdy merrymaking and obscenities, the church was forced to ban it. Sad. Number two, funeral rites. Medieval times, people were dropping like flies, just how things went. So, when it was time to deliver folks to their final resting place, some traditions were in order. For those that couldn't shake the Black Plague, they were put into big holes with the rest of the poor devils who couldn't also. Loved ones were taken care of with, well, great care and respect, and others, well, they had uh, modifications made to their graves. Like, for instance, if you were suspected of being a vampire, well, you'd be buried with a giant boulder on top of you, just in case, you don't know. Maybe you decide to wake up and come back to town for a midnight snack. Gotta be careful. Some were buried without heads, uh, the list goes on. All I can say is keep your garlic close, your wooden stakes, and 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 just always wash your hands, especially when handling the recently deceased. That's, you gotta get... Number one, duke it out. Couples in medieval Germany had an interesting way of figuring out their differences. Rather than just arguing like any normal couple, they took it to the octagon. Honestly, yeah, let's bring it back. 
Trial by single combat was a popular way to solve disagreements, and when man and wife were fighting, they had some great rules that had to be implemented. As one example, the husband had to stand in a hole with a hand behind his back while his wife got to run around with a sack filled with rocks. Seems a bit unfair, but hey, to each their own. I just imagine every time I have an argument with a girlfriend, and right in the middle of it, we just stop like, okay. I've had enough. We're settling this with our fisticuffs. Consult the marital duel rulebook and have at thee, foul beast.